It's talking about our salvation. Before we do that, let's just pray. Worship was so good tonight, and just, um, you know, I was just thinking about where, how great the God is that we serve, and just how, how personal and everything he is, and it just dovetails so well into the idea that, that he actually saves us. We look to you, Lord. You are truly. There is no one like you. You are above all things, all names. You're just um, fantastic and marvelous. We worship you, Lord. We just we honor you. We recognize you as our God. We recognize you as our Savior. The one who reaches out and redeems humanity. Yes, thank you, God. Thank and we are just so grateful, Lord. We're so blessed and thankful. And we ask you to be with us now as we talk about the world things concerning you, God. We need your spirit to help us, yes. teach us, and guide us, Lord. And pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, even with something like salvation, we could really dive deep into some stuff and we could talk about justification, redemption, propitiation, and all these big fancy theological terms. We're not going to do that tonight. What I, what I hope to do is just make two or three points about our salvation. One of the questions that arises in my mind, first of all, is, what does it mean to be saved? What are we saved from? I remember when I was in college, um, when I would open gym, this is just to show you guys how clueless I was. Where it, there was an open gym down at Tower Grove Baptist Church, and one of the guys I played basketball with was from there, and he said, Let's come on down for the open gym. Why? You had to sign in when you went in. They just wanted, I guess they just wanted to know who was there. And it was also an outreach program. And they asked you for your name and some information. And then they had a question, are you saved? And I looked at my buddy and I said, what, what does that mean? <laughs> Why am I saved? He just said, just put yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I put yes and played basketball, you know. And, that's how clueless I was. And, you know, I mean, even then, it's like, what does that mean? And today I'm thinking, what are we saved from? What does it mean to be saved? You know, it's, right? I mean, it could just have all kinds of, <clears throat> all kinds of meanings. Um, so in order to arrive at some understanding of what it means to be saved, I want to kind of go back to the beginning. If you have a Bible or a phone, if you can follow along a little bit, I'd really like for you to do that because some of the, some of the verses we're just going to turn to Genesis and just start there just look at a few verses that lay some key points that give us some key points we know these verses really well already but in Genesis 1 verse 27 and there's a point for going over these it's going to tie back in a little bit later to some of the things we're going to talk about Genesis one twenty seven says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the original design. The original point is that God created imagers. He created beings that would share his image and, and represent him and convey something about him in their very nature. And that's us as humans. Turn to chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3. Are you guys able to navigate your phones that quickly? I don't know how long it takes. <laughs> yeah. Genesis three seventeen. Is that where I want to start? Yeah, that's good. You know, we know the story. Adam and Eve fall. They disobey God and eat the forbidden fruit. And uh, 
and God says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat, cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you. And you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your face. You will eat bread till you return to the ground because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So there's a, there's a curse that happens because of the fall. There, um, the Hebrew word for curse means to set something apart for misery or punishment. So now the, the very ground, the very creation itself, has been set apart for punishment. All creation. It's all fallen under a judgment and designated for destruction, for misery. The misery begins right away. It's not even going to grow plants the same way it did before. It's going to also grow weeds, thistles, thorns. You're going to have to fight to get your food out of the ground now because it's fallen under this, this divine justice or, the, or a divine punishment. Like, like police work? Yeah, you're just you're just, you're just seeing the fruit of uh, or the evidence of this whole thing. So flip over to chapter six. A little commentary on how bad things really were. Look at verse five, or Genesis six, verse five. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually that's a sad commentary Mark will testify that it's true probably the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart and the Lord said I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land from man to animals to creeping things and to birds of the sky for I am sorry that I have made them so there's a, 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 can I call it cosmic? It's more, it's more than global. It's like, you know, there's this, there's this promise of divine judgment that's going to come because of the, the sin of man. And this is right after the story in the beginning of Genesis 6. It talks about the intermingling of the sons of God and the daughters of women and creating another race. There's all kinds of corruption on the earth. And so God's saying, I'm bringing judgment on all of it. And we know the story he does with the flood. It says in, in chapter 7, verse 23, that God blotted out every living thing that was on the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to the birds of the sky, and they were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left, together with those who were with him in the ark. There's a picture being played out here. A picture of divine judgment on all creation and a, and, and a few people being brought through or rescued through the judgment in a vessel that, that, we, that we know as the ark. But there's a picture, and we're going to see how that picture plays out even later. So the point here is that, you know, there, there, there is this, there's this divine universal curse Everything has been set apart for judgment. Everything has been set apart for wrath and misery. And even though this, it got this messed up, God did not abandon his original intent. His original intent, I want to create man to be my imagers. I want to create him to, be, to represent me, to bear my image before creation. And what was in the heart of God was to rule the earth through his human imagers. Now he could have just given up on that plan, right? He could have just said, well, that is so messed up. I'm going to go to plan B. But he didn't do that, really. He's, he, he never abandoned his original goal of ruling the planets through humans that bear his image. We're going to talk a little about what that means. That was his original plan. Anything that he would do short of that would be admitting defeat. God would just, he would have to throw his hands up and say, 
I had an intent, it got messed up, I have to go to something less than what I originally intended. And that would be like admitting that I can't do what I wanted to do. There's a, there's a, there's a, a sense of, or at least a, a degree of defeat that would be in an admission like that. And it's not, God is not in the business of being defeated. <laughs> so he's going to fulfill his original intent, which was to bring humanity into a place of being his representatives and ruling the planet through them. It's important that we kind of get that into our, call it our psyche, our theology. It has to be like the basis and the foundation of everything else that we, that we ever think about is that God has a plan. He never gave up on it and he will fulfill that plan. Chapter 9, Genesis 9. In the very beginning of the chapter, verse 1, we see God giving the same mandate to Noah that he had given to Adam. We didn't look at it, but we all know that God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth, right? Well, they're gone. The only people left are Noah and his family. God talks to them in chapter 9, verse 1. He tells them the same thing. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So we have the same mandate. See, these kind of things just are evidence that he hasn't given up on his plan. He's still going to do the same thing he originally intended to do. There's misery, though, involved in it now. Look at verse 2. and this is, Some things are changed. We've got a reset. We've had a reboot in humanity. And, and there are some things that are a little bit different. You remember before God told, told um, well, when he was even talking about the curse to Adam, he said, you're still going to have all the plants for food. It's just going to be a little bit harder to grow them. Well, now, he says in verse 2, the fear of you and the terror of you will be on every beast of the earth and on every bird of the sky. There's a, the, the supposition is that wasn't true before. You know, we think about how did Noah get all those animals into the ark? Well, they weren't afraid of him. And, and they didn't eat him, and he didn't eat them. It's changed. With everything that creeps on the ground and all the fish of the sea into your hand they are given, every moving thing that is alive shall be food for you. I give it all to you as I gave the green plant. See, I re- he originally gave the plant. Now he's given the animals to eat. That changes the relationship between man and animal when we start eating them. (laughs) Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely I will require your life blood from every beast I will require it, and from every man and from every man's brother I will require the life of man. Verse 6 is what I wanted to get to. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. It's significant that we see after the flood, after the fall, after the flood, we, we still see that one of the reasons God says you, you cannot kill another man is because he's made in the image of God. So the image is not gone. Whatever it is that we have that's, that makes us an image bearer, we still have, even after the fall and after the flood. It's not eradicated, and now we're, you know, we're, we're something less than what we were originally made to be. Make sense? So the image bearing is an interesting question. What does it mean to be an image More, but One of the things that I believe makes us an image bearer. It's one of the attributes we have as an image bearer of God is the ability to make choice. We don't reflect the image of God because he certainly has the ability to choose. Right? It's tricky. We're not image bearers because we can make a choice. We can make a choice because we're image bearers. 
because we bear the, the image of God and we share in his attributes, we have a free will. And this is a point of contention with some of the different schools of thought that are out there. I'm sure you've all encountered, um, you know, the Reformed theology. Reformed theology starts from the premise that you don't even have the ability to make a choice, that you can't. And so then they have to go down a path of saying, because you can't even choose, God has to, to do it for you. And he chooses whether or not the of God in your life is going to be sufficient for salvation. We don't really think that. I, you know, I believe that in the image of God means you have an ability to choose. And, and we're going to look at some verses that I think make it clear that our salvation is a combination of God's gift, God's grace, the, the gift of grace that God extends to us and our decision yeah. to embrace yeah. it. It's a combination of those things. And that should be, become a little bit more clear and, as we go along. So there's a pending wrath that, that rests over all of creation. Yeah, God promised I'll never flood the planet again. Put a rainbow in the sky, and every time you see the rainbow, you can be reminded, I'm never flooding the earth again. But there's a pending judgment and a pending wrath that rests on all creation. We see this, it carries forward into the New Testament. In Matthew 3, uh, John the Baptist, when he sees the Pharisees coming for baptism, he says, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? So there's this, there's this concept or this idea that there's a wrath that's coming in the future. There's a judgment, punishment, and, and more misery because the planet is under this, <clears throat> this judgment. In First Thessalonians, can you guys, do you, you mind, you know, sword drills? You remember what the old sword <laughs> drills were where you had to flip around? I, I, I just love for people to look at things so that you're not just listening, but you're actually reading along with it as... I think very helpful. First Thessalonians 1. As long as I don't wear you out turning to verses, I'd prefer to do that. So First Thessalonians 1, verses 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul, New Testament, is writing about these guys and the report he gets of the people in Thessalonica. And he says, these people themselves report about us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God. So there's, he's talking about their conversion. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. So Paul is concurring. He's, he's, he's uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He's agreeing with this idea that there's a pending wrath. There's something coming in the future where the wrath of God is going to once again be poured out on, on creation because of the fall, because of the sin and the, and the corruption. Paul talks about it in, in Romans 8 and just says the whole thing's corrupted and it's all been subjected to futility by him who subjected it. So God himself has subjected this whole thing to futility and pending wrath. And Paul's concurring with that here and he says, but it's Jesus who saves us, rescues us from that pending wrath, yeah. from the wrath yeah. to come. Yeah. When we talk about what it means to be saved... That's really the, the essence of it right there. God has made a way of escape for us, for those who are, what I say, I don't want, yeah, for those of us who choose to embrace it. There's a way of escape. There's a way of avoiding that, that pending wrath, that day of judgment. Peter, John and Jude all make reference to a future day of judgment. 
Paul talks about it in different terms, but he agrees with it just like we just read. He, you know, he just has a different way of saying it. In Romans, he talks again about being saved from the wrath to come. So they're all looking at this day in their theology and their understanding of what the Lord had taught them that all of creation lies under this judgment. There's a wrath and a, and a, and a punishment that's going to at some point be unleashed on, on all creation. It's a great, a terrible, it's great and terrible at the same time. This whole thing is under a curse. It's been set apart for punishment. And that includes us because we're part of that creation. But God's plan was to come back. He never deviated from his original goal, which was to have men, people, men and women. Don't mean to be exclusive. Um, Was to yeah. His his plan was to have people that would bear his image and rule the planet for him, and he would rule the planet through them. He never gave up on that from the very beginning. He, he let us know, yeah, well, okay, things are, you know, you've, you've fallen, you've made a mistake, and he turns to the serpent, he says, you're the, you're the deceiver that led him into this, and so you're cursed as well. You're going to have to crawl, you know, on your belly and not be able to even walk around like the other animals. And there's a day coming when a seed from humanity, he says the woman, but it's a human seed is going to come and have war or enmity with your seed. Two seeds now, you know, two two lines of humanity have been have been determined. One is the seed of the devil, the enemies of, of God. The other one is the seed of the woman or the seed of Abraham, because that same promise was was extended through the flood and given to Abraham. Paul makes mention of it in Colossians, and he says, you know, when God spoke to Abraham, he said, your seed, to your seed, I give these promises. And, his, and the descendants of that seed are the children and the heirs of the promise. And the seed is Christ. He is the one that came through Abraham. See, the whole point of Abraham was to get to Jesus. That, yeah, it's the whole point of it. It was just, I'm going to bring a human being to the planet who's going to get back to the original purpose. He's going to make a way for some of you to escape the pending judgment, the pending wrath. He's going to rescue you and save you through faith in his redemptive work. And he's going, to, Vic read the verse tonight that it just epitomizes and sums up the whole thing. Why is Jesus able to, um, to break the seals on the book in heaven? Because by his blood, he redeemed for God, he purchased for God a people for his own possession. It just sums up the whole story. All of man was under judgment. All of man was under this punishment, this pending punishment and misery that's about to come. And Jesus came, the seed came through the woman and through Adam and provided a way for redemption, to buy back, to buy out. You know, to redeem something means to buy it out of its, its present situation. He bought us out of that judgment, that pending judgment, purchased us, and he's able to present us to God through his blood. So what it means to be saved is it means to be saved from that coming judgment, from that pending judgment. It's God's plan, right? We had nothing to do with initiating it. We had nothing to do we we had nothing to do with implementing it. We can't help this thing along if, you know, if we had to, we, you know, we were lost. We were totally lost under the curse, under the, the judgment of God. And God initiated a plan to redeem us. That's why it's grace. Yeah. That's why there's, 
that all the talk on Paul says in Ephesians 2, salvation is the free gift of God's grace because you could do nothing to earn it. There was nothing to do. I, I, you know, you, you, I look for metaphors or um, you know, ways of explaining this kind of thing. And the, only, and the one that works the best for me, and they're all imperfect, but the one that works the best for me is the picture of a, you know, being out in the middle of the ocean, having no chance to swim to the shore, no chance of surviving. You're just out there yourself, nothing to help you, and it's inevitable. You're going from an outside source. And some person on a ship says, I have an idea. He may not even be that close to you. He has some means of, of firing a, 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 you know, one of those cannons that will fire a foam floaty with a rope on the end of it. He gets it way over to you, and you're smart enough to reach out and take hold of it. I mean, you know, it, it's not... Anything. If somebody rescues me like that, I'm not going to, you know, once they pull me in and get me up on the ship, I'm not going to say, whoo, boy, sure, I'm glad I saved myself. <laughs> I had no chance, right? There was no chance unless somebody did something for me. And that's the way I kind of see salvation. It is totally just a gift of God out of His grace. The mercy and the grace of God was extended to humanity. He brought out of redemption through Christ. That, that thread took us through Israel, and it took us through you know a number of um, took us through a number of really weird and interesting stories, you know, the, the threat of the threat of redemption and the, th- the genealogy from Adam right colorful characters yes. I'll just put it that way <laughs> so it, it's not like this pure thread, it's not pure until we get to Christ and then there's a purity that he brings into it, he is the seed that brings Redemption, the possibility of redemption for you and me and for, for everybody else. What a perfect picture of I mean, all the weird Beautiful. characters through it. Because we relate to all of it. Through the, through the story, you know, and God uses that. He does. But it's God's plan. It's God's idea. It's God's power. It's his original goal. He never abandoned the original goal. There's a rejoicing in heaven because Jesus purchased these people for God, the ones that he wanted from the beginning. Unfortunately, it's not everybody. But Paul says God desires for everybody to be saved. Right? Right? It's a tough, it's a tough verse for those of can and choose. I don't know how to reconcile those two thoughts. So even when we get into, and it's, you know, just a little deep with me here for a minute, because we get into the idea of predetermination or predestination and everything. I believe that when the Bible is talking, when Paul uses language, an original plan and he never gave up on it. He did predestine man to rule. That's why, you, that's why we were made. Before the foundation of the world, it was determined, I'm going to make man and I'm going to rule the planet through man. They're going to rule with me. We're co, co-regents. So it, it makes perfect sense to me that Paul or anybody else would use language like world that you would be saved through Christ. It was. That's different than God choosing which ones are and which ones are not. That's different, that, you know, by saying, look, all you guys, it, it's, I'm having a party next week. 
I'm inviting all of you. Welcome. I hope you all come. I know right now some of you would and some of you wouldn't for various reasons. It doesn't mean it wasn't predetermined that you would be there, whether you're there or not. I'm predetermining that you're invited to the party. I'm not telling Joe you can come and Margaret you can't. You're going to make those choices. And I could, and once the ones that are there are there, I could say, look, I determined last week for you guys to be here, right? I didn't choose which ones came and which ones didn't, but I determined you would be here. I predetermined that. And so that language doesn't cross me up. It doesn't, I, I don't have to go down a path of saying that God is just in such control of this thing that he's actually choosing and picking which people are a part of redemption and which ones are not. But when you start with the idea that man is totally depraved, completely incapable of even making a decision to go to the party, then I'm going to have to choose for you who's coming and who isn't coming. You see, you, you tracking with me? Does it make sense? And I don't agree with that. It just it doesn't align itself with. It doesn't align with God's character by any means, and, and that's so true. And it doesn't. It just doesn't fit the story. It just doesn't fit the idea that God is this self-described benevolent God, full of loving kindness and compassion, and then He's sitting up there making people who are and that He's determining and predestinating to, to, for, for judgment and wrath. It just doesn't work for me doesn't fit so but we have to have a way of explaining the, the language that that trips people up about things being predetermined and predestined and, and I hope that hope I clarified it a little bit at least clarified how I view it which is just yeah God did determine some things but not he, he determined them on a cosmic level not on the individual level he's not saying you're in, you're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. You just, it, it was determined on a cosmic level that you would all be part of God's eternal purpose. Some people have, yes. unfortunately, most people have managed to avoid it. One of the things we have trouble with, especially in Western civilization, and I'm not sure that the apostles the first century church had the same problems that we do. Yeah. Uh, it, their understanding was different. Um, but we're very individualistic people. Um, and we, we want to see us. Mm -hmm. I want to see me right there. Usually when those scriptures are spoken, they're plural. Mm -hmm. They're giving to a whole group. I predestined you know, I'm everybody, all of you. Everyone, you know, you have a choice. You know, I'm predestined for followers of Christ to be the ones that bear his image or bear his, you know, his, his power. Um, but we get caught up so many times in our, this is about me. This yeah. Is, you know, about my personal destiny. No, he's, he's predestined you know, that, that man will rule. But you can decide whether you're going to be part of that ruling <laughs> followers of Christ or not. You know, so. One of the unfortunate things about English is that we use the same word for an individual you and for all y'all. <clears throat> we just, you know, we use the same word and it's hard to tell when you're reading it in English which which uh, use are plural and which use are are singular. Right. It would be safe to make the assumption based on my observations and my diving into it. I would tell you, you're better off assuming it's plural than you are singular, because most of them are plural. Right. <clears throat> so if you're going to make an assumption, and like Vic's saying, in our rugged individualism, our natural assumption is, it's always about me. It's always singular. The assumption, your, your, your safer assumption would be to assume it's talking about all y'all. Because nine times out of ten it is. Right. 
And so it, it helps explain some of, the, some of the thoughts and some of the language. It's getting late, but let me just read a couple verses here. Um, in John 6, Jesus says, No one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So there's a, there's a drawing and a grace that, that happens by God. He's drawing men to himself. And then in, yeah, and then in Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, I tell, you, I, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he's making regard, he's making reference to a story about some people perishing. And his point is, if you don't repent, you're going to perish too. Well, what sense does it make for him to say that if people can't repent? You know, if they, if they have no choice, they, you're just, you're, e- you're either in or you're out based on God's foreknowledge and his predetermination. So we see salvation clearly includes two things. It includes the grace of God reaching out to man, and it includes man's response to that grace. It's not a big deal to grab hold of the life buoy when it comes floating by. You know, it's, I, I can't boast in that. It's just, thank God he threw it. And it seems pretty dumb not to grab it. It seems really <laughs> dumb. Once, you see, once your eyes are open, it looks really dumb. You're not really seeing yes. the peril you're in. And, yes. <laughs> and most people don't. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the saddest thing is folks that have grown up, you know, kind of holding on to it, and then they're like, that. Yeah. Bearing that image. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, we were we were made to represent God, and we're, we're so we bear an image of God, and I think it doesn't mean we look like Him. It does, I don't, God doesn't have to look like a human in order for us to bear his image. <clears throat> it means more that we, we carry godly attributes. We, we carry an image of him with us, and, and, that, and, those, and that image is, is conveyed in attributes that we have, not, not in our facial expressions even, or in the way we look, two arms and two feet and all that. That's not what makes us an image bearer. It's that we have qualities and characters of and, and characteristics of God that we present to the rest of creation. One of those, in my opinion, and my and I have a, a strong conviction of this, one of those attributes is free will. We can't be an image bearer of God if we don't have a free will. Amen. Then we're we're something other than we're an automaton. And God's not an automaton. He didn't create a bunch of automatons to, to be like him. He created free will image bearers. Now there's a you know there's a work called sanctification that we need to talk about at some point, and that you know there's 
the image of God in us is sometimes tainted because of our sin. And Paul makes reference in, in Colossians to we're being changed from glory to glory, from step to step. We're, the image of God is being made more clear in us. But you are an image bearer just by the fact that you're a human being. You, you have, you, it's just a fact. You were made to be an image bearer. So you, you are bearing an image of God. It's not as clear in some people as it is in others, and there's a and there's a process of God's operation in our life to make us. I guess you could say it this way to to, to help us, you know, bear that image a little more clearly. I think that's what Paul's talking about in Colossians. Did you have a question? That's why we're told not to that. make an image. Yeah, but Jesus is that image. Yeah. He is that image. Yeah. Representation. In Hebrews, it says he's the exact representation of his nature, which yeah. which is what makes him that image bearer. He's he's yeah. he's bearing the nature and the image of God, and that's why he says to Philip, "Of, don't you know if you've seen me, you've seen God." You know, it's like. Yeah, it's like, you know, why do you ask to see the Father? I, yeah. l- look, I bear his image. Yeah. Exactly, you and know. Then, like, whenever the Lord appeared to Moses, you know, he passed before him, and since you know, it, it, he didn't really talk, to, he didn't have an image passed before him, but all of his goodness, his right. glory, and his yeah. attributes passed before him. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, that's good to think about. And you think about yeah. the value that we put on. someone is born with defects and whatever. Yeah. That they're they're still bearing the image of God yeah. because yeah. it's not exactly. about that. Right. It's right. about yeah. the, the attributes that, that the human being carries, you know. And, and yeah, we just so saw we value those that have, you know, less physical, you know, abilities or whatever, you know, or being young or being very old, you know. They're image bearers. Mm-hmm. Every one of us are, right. not because of not because of our physical state, mm-hmm. but because because of the reality of, of, of those attributes that we were that made to be that. We yeah, were made that way. Kind of always kind of an under the surface kind of thought, you know, that like if you're made in the image of God, God has a eyes and a nose. Yeah, and right. Ears, you know right. I mean? yeah. No one ever really says that, but it's kind of under the under the surface, like assume yeah. that when people when you say that. It doesn't have to be true for us to bear yeah. the image. Yeah. But the whole sanctity of life issue we're right in the middle of right now. I mean, the Germans said they're only Jews. They're subhuman, you know. Yeah. Or it's only a fetus. It's not a human being. They're going to use the word fetus because it's not a real human being. That's the yeah. whole battle of sanctity of human life, no matter who it is. You can't cross that line and say, well, I'm a Christian, but I believe in abortion. Well, you've got to make a choice. You can't have both. Yeah. But, but some of those things are deceptive, you know, and, and and talking about these things can make a difference when you realize human life has value because it has value, because they're image bearers, you know, uh, wherever you are. You know. We didn't cover as much as I wanted. We'll just pick it up there next week and continue this conversation. I'm sorry the Sipes won't be here. Are you all leaving somewhere? Catherine or whoever knows? I don't know what's happening. You don't know what's happening? <laughs> oh, cool. Go see the Megans? Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Should we, should we pray? Let's pray. It's in, man. Yeah, let's pray. Close. Lord, we're just grateful for your salvation. We're grateful for the grace of God. We thank you, Lord, that you reached out and rescued us. We're even thankful for the grace that you extended to us, Lord, to open our eyes and help us to see and embrace the redemption, embrace your salvation. God, we just pray that you would help others, people that we know in our families, family and friends, and 
neighbors and uh, whoever, God, just we pray for their redemption too. We pray for their salvation. And ask to extend mercy and grace, God, in a great way. And um, just bless us as we go home with your spirit. Continue to teach us and guide us, Lord, and bless the sipes as they travel next week. Amen. Amen.